things fulfill. This is William Bell, and we are delighted to be with you. We are looking forward to a great broadcast this morning where we're going to be talking from Revelation chapter 11 and uh, other related passages on the sounding of the last trumpet. Kind of pick up a little bit from what we talked about on yesterday and uh, continue that. And with me this morning is my co-host, uh, Digital Pit Boss, and uh, we'll just call him Pit, Pit Boss, uh, but he's here this morning. Uh, how are you doing? I'm great today, Miss Bell. How are you? And uh, good, evening, good afternoon to all of the listeners. All righty. Well, we are um, looking forward to a, a great time this morning, and uh, we'll be getting started here just uh, shortly. But as always, a word from our sponsors. And today, ladies and gentlemen, once again, we want to remind you to visit Builders, Floors, and Interiors, a full-service flooring company located north of the Wolf Chase Mall, and the proprietor is Gwen Christensen. You can reach her at 901-382-2155. Now, they offer you all your flooring needs, from laminates to carpet to vinyl and to ceramic tile, offering you complete installation services and uh, interior decorating services. Gwen Christensen has been in the business for over 18 years. They have an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau and a ton of satisfied customers. I'm one of them <laughs> on more than one occasion. As a matter of fact, she just recently did a, a house for me where she came in, did the kitchen, the bathroom with, with vinyl floors and also carpeting throughout the house. And uh, it was very excellent job and well done. So when you need great installation services as well as someone to help you to choose those just the right colors and textures, etc., she's the person to do it. She has an eye for coordinating colors and of course you know that your floors and your walls are the biggest uh, part of your decoration in your home when you think about it. And to have someone who can be able to coordinate that for you and make sure you don't make those decorating faux pas then make sure that you contact Gwen Christensen with Builders, Floors, and Interiors, located at 3085 Stage Post Road, just north of the Wolf Chase Mall in the Memphis area. And uh, the number is 901-382-2155. That's 901-382-2155. Give her a call today. Secondly, our sponsor is Servant's Heart Christian Bookstore your one-stop shop for all your church supplies. So go there for your Bibles, for your books. And by the way, you can find a book there by William Bell and also by Don Preston, and we expect to have more books there as well. But uh, shop there for your Bibles, your books, and other supplies that you need for uh, your church services and, um, and other things that pertain to to your ministries. You can talk to Mr. Bobby Moraine. Let him know that you were sent there by William Bell right here on All Things uh, Fulfill radio broadcast. His number is 794-2038. That's 901-794-2038. They're located between Hickory Hill and Kirby Parkway at 6188 East Shelby Drive. Again, that number is 901-794-3038. We want to thank all of our sponsors. And if you are listening and would like to uh, be a sponsor of our show, then please contact us. The number you can call is um, 657-383-1045. We'll be happy to talk with you. Or you can reach me at 901 641 and talk about uh, some of the ways in which uh, we can help you as a sponsor uh, to make sure that the word gets out about your business. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we've got that business out of the way. Now we're going to get down to some real business today, and that is the business of the Lord in talking about these matters that pertain to our uh, eternal salvation, that pertain to uh, Bible prophecy, which is a very, very important topic. As a matter of fact, uh, the other day, I got a question on why was I talking about a prophecy that was 2,000 years old. Well, ladies and gentlemen, everybody talks about prophecy that's about 2,000 years old and older because that's the only place we're going to really find divinely inspired prophecy. If it's not written in the book, then it's not of God. 
So um, we have to make sure that we stay with the book. As the Bible says, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly furnished to every good work. And no prophecy of the Scripture was given by any private interpretation, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So if we're going to talk about the words of the Spirit, we definitely need to be talking about prophecy. We see that we have a guest online. I'm going to open the line and bring him in as well. And uh, so give me just a moment, and we'll get that done. Good morning. You're on the air with All Things Fulfill. Who do we have? Hello, are you there? Okay, maybe they took a break for a moment. We'll leave the line open, and maybe they will uh, they will come on. But it looks like um, uh, we have a, a caller uh, who is uh, maybe listening in, and so if that is the case, we, we uh, just hope that you will stay on and let us know who you are. All right, so we're on this morning, and we're going to be talking about when did the last trumpet sound in the book of Revelation? When did the last trumpet sound in the book of Revelation? Um, the book of Revelation is a great book. As a matter of fact, it was one of the first books that I began to study when I became a Christian because I was fascinated with it. Everybody was afraid of the book. They were you know, uh, afraid that they were going to have the mark of the beast and all of these things that they talked about, locusts and everything coming up out of the ground. And um, it was just a terrifying thing. And then there were other people who were members of the church, who actually taught that people shouldn't even talk about the book of Revelation. I think the reason they said that is because they were afraid that there was so much speculation going on that they were trying to keep people from uh, going off on these wild tangents. And, of course, you know, I was very young and uh, didn't know very much about the Bible or the book of Revelation, but my curiosity for it was so great that I started to try to figure things out. And the first area that I approached was the dating of the book of Revelation, because I knew there were two major um, premises about the date. Some believe that was written before the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 A.D. Others took a later date around 95 to 96 A.D. And I said, well, here's one thing I know just based on that. If the date is after 70 A.D., then you can't apply the contents of the book to that event. You can't apply it to 70 A.D. And if it is before 70 A.D., however, then you have to at least give that some consideration if you're going to look at the book, especially since some people were saying that it applied. Then I also discovered that uh, many of our scholars, until... John Darby and uh, others who brought in the influence of uh, dispensationalism all held to, I mean, there's a, a, a plethora of scholars who held to the earlier date of the book of Revelation, and that pendulum began to swing right after the influence of Darbyism came in, but now it's beginning to swing back uh, among the scholars. But when I looked at that some years ago, before I knew even anything about the scholars, uh, I said, well, this should be where I start. Let's determine what the dating of the book is. Then I'll know what pathway to pursue, uh, whether or not I should even be looking at 70 AD as a, as a, as a possible means. And uh, so I did that, and I found some great books to study. And uh, they made some very impressive arguments that still stand to this very day. And that's where I have kind of hung my head. I'm not going to get into a discussion on the dating of it at this moment. We're going to be talking about a particular passage. And in speaking of that passage, of course, some of that will come about. Now, let me also say that uh, one of the biggest challenges, problems, concerns, um, and points that I would suggest to anyone or to consider if you're going to study the book of Revelation, is please take a moment of pause and read the first verse carefully, slowly, thoughtfully, and most importantly, uh, scripturally. If you have to get out a lexicon, 
you know, which is nothing but a Greek dictionary, and interpret the words, you know, define the words in the text. Do that. And then try to keep that in mind as you're going forward in the book. And not only that, but do it again in the last chapter of the book, because some of the same words are mentioned there. And I call them chronological and historical bookends for the book of Revelation. Here's what I mean by that. In the first verse, the Bible says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him, to show to his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John. Now the Bible says these were things which must shortly come to pass. So he was writing about events that were going to take place within a short span of time from the perspective of the time in which the book was written. But not only that, he goes on to say, Blessed is he, or rather, he goes on, he says, uh, who bore witness, rather, to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ. You know, he sent it to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God, to the testimony of Jesus Christ, to all things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads... And those who hear the words of this prophecy, and by the way, ladies and gentlemen, it's not multiple prophecies. The word prophecy there is singular. It's one prophecy, several facets to it, but there was one prophecy that this book was getting across. And keep those things which are written in it for the time has drawn near. When you look that word up in the original, it literally means the time has drawn near. So you put those two together. The time was shortly to come to pass, and or the events were shortly to come to pass, and the time for the events to shortly come to pass was near. Now, if you go to the back of the book, that's the first book in, and you know, you can't just put one book in on some books and let them stand because they'll fall to one side. So in order for it to stand, then you go to the end of the book, and you see what's written there. So when you turn to Revelation chapter 22, and I say this because this sets the parameters for our understanding of the sounding of the, se- of the seventh trumpet. In Revelation chapter 22, starting in verse 6, the text says, Then he said to me, These words are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show his servants the things which must shortly take place. So here again, same verse, same concept mentioned in Revelation 1.1 is mentioned in Revelation 22 and verse 6. Then he says, Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy, note again, singular, of this book. Now I, John saw and heard these things, and when I heard and saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel who showed these things to me. Then he said to me, See that you do it not, or do not do it, for I am your fellow servant, and of your brethren the prophets, and of those who keep the words of this book, worship God. And he said to me, Do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book, again, singular prophecy, for the time is at hand. The time is drawn near. So, This is important because when you look at the prophecy of Daniel, when Daniel spoke about the end time and spoke about the things that we find in the book of Revelation, Daniel was told to seal the book for the time of the end. That's Daniel 12 and verse 4. He talked about the time of affliction or the great tribulation, which Jesus alludes to and and actually quotes in Matthew 24, 21. In the next verse, we have resurrection, and Jesus follows that same pattern in Matthew 24 and verse 31, which is about the trumpet, which we're going to talk about. And he said 
that many who slept in the dust of the earth, etc., which is the resurrection text. But then he tells Daniel, seal up the sayings of this book for the time of the end. So Daniel was told to seal it up, but he wrote 600 years before the information or the prophecy that we find in the book of Revelation. Now, if Daniel was told to seal it up because it would not be fulfilled for 600 years, or, or if he is told 600 years before to seal it up because the time was for the end, and then John receives the same prophecies of Daniel and is told, do not seal the book for the time is near, then common sense and simple reasoning should tell us events or the time for the events that John speaks about, no matter what your view of Revelation is and what your concept of the time, it should stand to reason that it would be fulfilled in less than 600 years. Because if it's longer than that, why wouldn't he tell John to seal it up like he did Daniel? So that, to me, is, is very, very important. But as you will get into the book, you will see that the time frame is much shorter than 600 years. Because he said, the time is near. Things were going to happen quickly. Why do you use these terms for something that is far off and in the opinions of some hasn't even occurred to this day? Keep those things with the, which are written. Do not seal the book, for the time is at hand. And that's why Christ made the statement, the person who's unjust, let him be unjust still. We know how long it takes to even change a habit, <laughs> let alone people to change their whole lifestyle. And people who had hardened their hearts, they weren't going to change from the short time that the Lord was coming. It would make sense for him to be telling people that for 2,000 years, if you're unjust, remain unjust. See, that makes no sense. But it does make sense in a very imminent context when things were soon to happen because more than likely people are going to be just the way they were and they were going to remain that way, especially after they had been preached to for almost 40 years from our perspective. And thus, uh, he said he was coming quickly. Now, let me just, before I leave this, before we get into the heart of the matter, in verse 12, he quotes a passage which we've covered several times. He says, and behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man or everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Now, that statement, I am coming quickly and my reward is with me, is directly from Matthew 16, 27 and 28. That's where the text says, For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his holy angels, and then he will reward everyone according to his work. But it doesn't stop there. He says, verily, verily, I say to you, there are some standing here, meaning in the very presence of Christ, just like Pit Boss and I are on this broadcast and we have another person on that we haven't uh, identified as of yet or he hasn't identified himself or she, whomever it may be. But the point is, as we are here today, all together, live on this broadcast, that's what the Lord was saying. There are some standing here who will not die until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now, uh, Brother Pitt Boss, let me ask you a question. If I were to say to you that you would not die or that one of us, one of the two of us, or one of the three of us, would not die until we see, had seen the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And then we look back, and all of us have died. If you didn't see it before you died, what would you say about that prophecy? 
I would concur that the prophecy was untrue. Okay. And what would you say about the prophet? And then I would uh, I would then concur that the prophecy the prophet was not real. Okay. Isn't that exactly what Moses said in Deuteronomy 18 about how to determine whether a prophet was a true prophet or not? Deuteronomy 18, I think it's 21 and 22, when he made the prophecy concerning Christ and said that God would raise up a prophet from among their brethren, like him, like Moses, and he would put his words into his mouth, and he says, and every soul who will not hear that prophet would be cut off from the people. So then once he told Israel that, they said, well, how shall we know whether these are the words that the Lord have spoken or has spoken? So this was the response that he gave them. He said in verse uh, 20, uh, 20, 21, he said, and if you say in your heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not happen or come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You shall not be afraid of him. Now, I want to go back to this one more time, uh, Brother Pitt Boss, because there's another out that we have. It doesn't have to mean that... Um, the Lord lied. And by the way, do you know that a lot of people actually say that? I don't care what background they're from. There are people who are Muslims. There are people who are uh, Jews. You know, there are people who are Christians. And there are atheists who say, here's how we know the Lord was a liar. This is the way we know he was a false prophet, because he predicted he was going to return in the first century, and he did not do it. That's documented. Even many of the German rationalists, they didn't become rationalists because that's what they woke up desiring to do. They were staunch Bible believers until they ran across the teachings of Christ on his return. They could not figure it out. And so they said, well, the only conclusion is he must be a liar, and therefore we're giving up our faith because the Bible is, is false. Now, when you put this in front of some Christians who read the Bible every day, you can tell them this, and they won't make that conclusion. They'll just say, well, you know, they'll just keep on not even realizing that they have this dichotomy in their belief system. But there is another way out that I've heard people say. If he told them that some of you will not die until you see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom, well, if they say the kingdom hasn't come and therefore the Lord hasn't come and vice versa, then perhaps some of these people are still walking around on earth today from the first century. What are your thoughts on that? That would be amazing. <laughs> that would be amazing. <laughs> that's a farther stretch than anything I know, right? Yeah, and one that's, thing that's true. is the case, if they were standing in the presence of Christ and they are still here from the first century, we would have this matter settled, wouldn't we? No doubt. But anyway, ladies and gentlemen, that's kind of the problems that we face. So I, I gave you that little foundation on these bookends, I call them, for the book of Revelation. So you got the first verse, first three verses, and then you have in the end of the book, and they both say these are things which were shortly to come to pass, shortly to be done. The time was near, not far, and the Bible knows the di difference between something near and far. The time was near. And then we'll, you know, at some point in time, we'll get into people saying, well, that's near in the, in the language of God. Well, God was communicating with man. We'll get into that when it's, when it's appropriate. So let's talk about this last trumpet, because we introduced it on yesterday, and there are some things associated with the last trumpet. And uh, so when did that last trumpet sound? Is this something that we are yet awaiting uh, to happen? Because we know that there are some events that take place when the seventh trumpet sounds. All right, if we go to Revelation chapter 10, Revelation the 10th chapter, the Bible talks about 
the sounding of the seventh trumpet and what it's connected to as it relates to Bible prophecy. The text says, but in the days when, uh, uh, excuse me, in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, and the seventh angel would sound the seventh trumpet, when he is about to sound the mystery of God would be finished as he declared to his servants, the prophets. Now, here's the text that says, when the seventh angel is about to sound, the mystery of God would be finished as he has declared to his servants, the prophets. Now, since we're talking about the seventh trumpet, and he introduces the mystery and then says that it would be finished, not begun, not delayed, but finished when that seventh trumpet sounds, as he has declared to his servants the prophets. Which means we should be able to go back into the prophets and find the text associated with the sounding of the trumpet and the mystery of God. Now, let's define the mystery of God, as is spoken of here. Pitboss, let me ask you the question. Mystery. Think about that for a moment. Mystery. Can you tell me, in your mind or source, is in the Bible, particularly in the New Testament, what is what does the Bible mean when it says mystery? Or what does the word itself mean? Either way. Well, definitely a mystery would be something um, unknown, and I, I believe it's applying to the coming of the Lord and uh, also with the completion of judging uh, the, the the people. Okay. At this All right. The All right. Very good. Okay. Now you you touched on something with the first, when you said it's something unknown. That's what a mystery is. It's something unknown, but it's not necessarily unknowable. Right. That's correct. Because if do you have anything in your pocket right now? Don't tell me what uh, it is. Yes, sir. Okay, so you have something in your pocket. Okay, so audience, everybody knows Pit Boss has something in his pocket. Now, what I'd like to ask, do you, how many things do you have in your pocket? One item or more than one? Just one item. Okay, you have just one item. Well, now you made it too easy for us. Because, you know, my first answer is going to be your keys are in your pocket. Am I right or wrong? That's n not the mystery. Okay, good, good. That's that's awesome. So see, ladies and gentlemen, there is something in his pocket. I made my best guess, and I'm wrong. Now, the other thing you might say is a billfold, but here's the point. I can only know exactly what's in his pocket after he reveals it to me. So if you don't mind revealing it, what's in your pocket? I have a receipt from, from the store uh, from earlier this morning. Okay. I would never have guessed that. I don't think anybody in the audience would have guessed it. But see, that's what we mean about a mystery. It was something unknown until it is revealed. Now it's knowable. It's no longer a mystery. We know he has a, has a um, receipt in his pocket. Well, if you turn to Ephesians, the third chapter, Paul basically says the same thing that we just illustrated in that example. When you look at Ephesians chapter 3, beginning at verse 2, well, actually, we can start at 1. He says, for this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to me, now watch what he says, how that by revelation, that means to reveal, to unveil something, 
And we're talking about the book of what? Revelation, which is from the word apocalypsis, which means an unveiling. But just note here, how that by revelation he made known to me what? The mystery. He made known to me the mystery. As I have written already, or briefly written already, but now watch this. Paul knows the mystery. He was an apostle. God had revealed to him the mystery. And he says that I've already written about it briefly to you. Now watch what he says. By which, when you read, you may understand my knowledge. In the mystery of Christ which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. Now let's hold it there. Paul said, when you read what I have written, you may then understand my knowledge. In other words, we can get the same knowledge that the apostle Paul had when we read what he wrote about the mystery. And therefore, we will know the mystery as he knew it. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Okay. So now let's see what he tells us that the mystery is so we can know what would be finished when the seventh angel sounded in the book of Revelation. The text says, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men as it has now been revealed. And I love the way Paul uses the word now. <laughs> as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets, the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel, of which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God, which was given to me by the effectual working of his power. So here Paul then says, the mystery that God had kept secret since the age began, Romans 15, 26, or 25 and 26, was that the Gentiles and Israel would one day become members of the same body and would be partakers of the same promise, which would have been the promise of Abraham. but it was going to happen through the gospel, not through Torah. Now, if you go to chapter 2 just quickly, I know some people might be saying, well, he's taking a long time to get to the trumpet. <laughs> I'm working with the trumpet, ladies and gentlemen. This is, this is what the trumpet is about. In chapter 2 of Ephesians, he says in verse 11, therefore remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, and we know Israel was circumcised. Gentiles were uncircumcised. And I don't have a problem with some of Israel being uncircumcised. I don't limit it to just the people of Israel being uncircumcised. I do agree that as they moved away from Torah, some of them refused to keep Torah. But they weren't the only ones who were uncircumcised. So the, I include them. I don't exclude them or make this uh, one as opposed to the other. But the point being, there was definitely an uncircumcised group versus a circumcised group, which made two groups. Anyway, you count that. And so he says, therefore, remember that you, 
once Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by what is called a circumcision. And by the way, since we're on this point, even when I'm talking to Hebrew Israelites or ISUPK, and I, when I listen to them, I hear the argument made, not all of them, but I hear the argument made sometime, um, and by Israel-only groups as well, that, well, Ephesians 2.11, and they will cite Ezekiel 37, and I'm, I'm aware of that, with the two sticks of, of, you know, of Ephraim and of Judah, and God saying, in the last days, I'm going to bring these two sticks together and make them one stick, which I think is the background of Ezekiel chapter 37, I mean, of uh, Ephesians 2. I, and so I recognize that. But when they talk about this, they want to see, well, see, that was Israel. All of this is talking about Israel, and I understand that. But here's the point. The Bible says, according to the covenant made with Abraham in Genesis chapter 17, that if you were not circumcised, you were what? Cut off from the people. Now, if the people, ladies and gentlemen, Israel, and if you are cut off from the people, then what does that mean? That's what Hosea talked about. You are not my people, and I will not be your God. And it will come to pass in the place where I said to them, you are not my people, there it shall be said, you are my God people and I will be your God so either way we slice the cake if they're uncircumcised they're not God's people call them what you want now so we have these two people here and he says that at that time and let me read the rest of it he said you were called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made without hands, or made, excuse me, the circumcision made in the flesh by hands. That's a good phrase to underline, too, when you're studying these themes, is the contrast between made by hands and made without hands. And you will notice that it's always talking about covenantal things when that phrase is used. Not biological things per se, but covenantal things. Circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ. Now, you're going to tell me that a person without Christ, without God, is in the covenant? No. Call them what you want. Being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of promise having no hope and without God in the world. Now watch the contrast. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace. The word peace means to bind together, to bind together as one. And you need three things for peace, ladies and gentlemen. You need the absence of war. And when a man is in sin, he is at war with God. You also need security. In other words, protection from attack. But that doesn't mean you have peace yet, because let's take the city of Jerusalem, or any city that we're warring and bombing today, all right? You can stop the bombing today, but what do you have after you stop the bombing? Nothing but destruction and devastation and disruption of life. You can build a wall around it so that the enemy can no longer penetrate, but what's inside? Nothing but destruction, disruption of life. You don't have peace until you have prosperity. When you have a society that can thrive and survive and produce and live and enjoy 
the pursuit of life and happiness, then you have peace in a society. And the same thing is true on a spiritual level. If we're at war with God because of sin and we have no protection and we have no prosperity. But see, that's what God brings to us in the gospel. The war ceases when we give up sin, when we give up a life of rebellion and accept Jesus Christ who becomes our protection where no man can pluck us out of his hand. Where if God is for us, who can be against us? Where we have the victory in Christ Jesus. Not hoping for it, we have it. That's a whole different paradigm from which to live. And this is where we're trying to get people to. You need to see that you have a victory, not you're hoping for one. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, teen in verse 12. So the prosperity, I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. This is not the Creflo dollar buy me a jet gospel. We're talking about your soul prospering, you prospering in the blessings of God, where he's given you all things that pertain to life and godliness. But that mystery was the Jew and the Gentile, the uncircumcised and the circumcised, coming together in one body. Couldn't do as long as the law stayed there, as long as Torah was there, because Torah separated them based on that very thing. If you're uncircumcised, you can't come in here. As a matter of fact, if a Gentile tried to cross the line in the temple, he would be put to death. That middle wall of partition is now broken down. That was the mystery that Israel didn't know. And the Bible says in Revelation chapter 10 and verse 7, when the seventh angel sounds, the mystery of God would be finished as he has declared to his servants the prophets. So we have to see in the mystery and in the sounding of the seventh trumpet, the gathering together of Israel from the four winds is finished. And people are still walking around trying to be gathered. And they don't understand the gathering is finished because of the sounding of the seventh trumpet. Now, there's, I can't finish today because I only gave us 45 minutes. So we're going to have to pick up here because I'm going to go to Isaiah 27 and we're going to look at the trumpet and we're going to see that it was about the gathering. And then we're going to go to Matthew 24, 31 and we're going to see that it was about the gathering. And then we're going to look at Ephesians 1, 10 and we're going to see that it was about the gathering. And we're going to look at 2 Thessalonians 2 and 2, and we're going to see that, it, or 2 1, and we're going to see that it was about the gathering, and Hebrews 10 and verse 25, and we're going to see that it was about the gathering, but we're also going to see that it was shortly to come to pass. The time was near. The mystery of God was about to be finished. And then we're going to get into the sounding of that trumpet in chapter 11, verses 15 through 18, and look at what it's connected to. Well, ladies and gentlemen, technically, we're out of time. And as you can see, I'm just getting wound up. But we'll be back on tomorrow to take this a step further. I appreciate everyone who tuned in today and those who will tune in after the broadcast. You can, uh, if you caught the middle of it, you can catch the full broadcast within about 15 minutes of the end of the show, so you can go back and listen to it. And um, I want to give a shout out to our sponsors very quickly as we close for today. Builders Floors and Interiors, a full-service flooring company offering you laminates, carpet, vinyl, and ceramic tile, complete installation, 
A plus rating with the Better Business Bureau and all your decorating needs. Located north of the Wolf Chase Mall in Memphis. And uh, phone number 901 382 2155. That's 901 382 2155. They're located at 3085 Stage Post Road. Also, ladies and gentlemen, Servant's Heart Bookstore. Servant's Heart Christian Bookstore, located at 6188 East Shelby Drive. Bobby Moraine is the proprietor there. You can reach him at 901-794-3038. That's 901-794-3038. All of your shopping needs, your one-stop shop for all of your church supplies, for your Bibles, your books, and other supplies. Uh, please use them. Let them know that you heard about them on this radio broadcast, All Things Fulfilled. Well, Brother Pit Boss, you got me wound up today, man. <laughs> Uh, any closing comments that you would like to make from today's broadcast? Well, I would like for the listeners, if they are not of the preterist perspective, but they are definitely believers in the Bible, to comment on what they heard and uh, give us some feedback so that we'll, uh, we could understand um, their perspective and answer the questions. All right. Well, thank you very much. We appreciate you um, helping us out with the show. I mean, you know, we, we couldn't do this without your support, and so we appreciate it very much, ladies and gentlemen. We thank you for tuning in. We look forward to being back with you again where we continue on this subject of the sounding of the seventh trumpet, the completion of the mystery of God, the gathering of the elect, and uh, we'll delve more deeply into that on tomorrow. I gave you a few scriptures to note down so that you'll be prepared for us when we come back on uh, on tomorrow. And, uh, and we'll look into this subject a little bit more. Uh, with that, I'm William Bell with All Things Fulfilled, your co-host, Digital Pit Boss. And we say to you, have a very uh, blessed and good morning.